friends, uh, I think the chairperson asked me to elaborate on the institutional affiliation I have. I am um, part of a small research group called the Society for Promoting Participative Ecosystem Management. Uh, I think the program sheet puts topic on that's a uh, brief. Uh, it's a small group of people, basically a research-based organization, try to understand water and energy issues. So we have been able to do, ground some innovative ideas, both in terms of uh, uh, water as well as uh, energy. So I would like to share some of the experience, the type of uh, work we have done in the energy uh, field. That's what I primarily do. Uh, second caveat I have, I mean, more than that, I've been also a full-time political activist for about 10 years, so some of the experience which I'm going to share with you also draws from that. So I'm also part of a toilet uh, movement in South Maharashtra. So I wear these two caps, so uh, that's what it is. Uh, basically, the type of work I'm going to share with you has been anchored primarily by my senior colleague, uh, late K.R. Date. I think I'm sure some of you know him. And later, uh, it has been carried forward by a colleague called Vilas Gore. So in, in fact, it would have been good if Vilas was here to share these experiences. Uh, but, but anyway, here, yeah, I mean, anyway. Uh, but I would say is that since the time is short, I won't get into some of the technical details and other type of things. Basically, to show there are certain pathways in which we can explore these things further. Uh, there's a book called Bagging on Biomass, primarily uh, authored by Kair Dati and assisted by some of us. So that is a book in which some of these key concepts and some of these experience have been documented. And recently, there's also a short film made on Dati called uh, Kair Dati Exploring Energy Pathways. It is available both in Marathi with English subtitles and also in English, made by a f filmmaker called uh, Atul Pete from Pune. So these sources are there. There are other materials which are available. So probably those people who want to get into the details, uh, we can take this forward. Uh, I have titled this uh, small uh, discussion topic, uh, presentation called Use of Biomass in Infrastructure. Uh, in fact, I should also say that uh, that part we're going to present is uh, actually an integral part of a larger perspective. And I think it's, uh, though I may not go into the details of the larger perspective, it's important to keep this in mind. Because otherwise, when you talk about uh, biomass or biofuels and other type of thing, this whole debate about you know, food versus fuel and other type of things. But here we see biomass as an integral part of a uh, pathway towards a sustainable prosperity and starting with assuring a basic livelihoods to all. So I think this is an important starting point for all. I mean, the type of concern with which we started on this uh, new experiments and things where assurance of livelihoods as the starting point and things and whatever we are talking about taking the society beyond subsistence to more of a sustainable prosperity is a takeoff from uh, that. So here, second assumption is that uh, people who are dependent on livelihoods for water and uh, land, for example, for their livelihood needs, access to land and water is an important precondition. I mean, whatever innovation we talk about, I think this is an important thing. So this is a point which I want to come back uh, towards the end of my presentation. Third thing is that when we talk about, I'm connected to the first point I made about a sustainable prosperity perspective, uh, is that um, uh, we have also tried to work out some type of biomass balances, uh, taking basically into the rural toilets, especially who are dependent on uh, agriculture or other type of thing, you know, uh, middle peasantry or toil peasantry, saying that what is the type of biomass, you know, whether it is a modern society or uh, you know, um, uh, traditional societies, we all depend on biomass either directly or indirectly for to meet many of our needs and things. So we have tried to work out in different agroclimatic conditions and things that type of water, bi you know, bio water and biomass balance and things. And here we are saying that after meeting all the uh, needs, including food, fuel, fodder, uh, fodder, I mean, for livestock and other type of things, and also certain biomass going into your agriculture system as throughput, uh, we would be able to generate uh, something like about three ton. Uh, biomass in different forms as a surplus biomass. And here I'm going to talk about this surplus three ton biomass, which can pave uh, uh, the base for a new agro industrial uh, society and things. And here I would share broadly the type of broad comments which Raghunandan made. Because we are a young population, people who are going to demand independent livelihoods in terms of proportionately is going to be higher. And uh, agriculture alone or primary production alone may not be able to meet the genuine aspirations and the livelihoods of the people. And we need to think of a different pathway. And here we are talking about a, what is that pathway which is a low carbon uh, type of thing. I also share uh, with Raghunanda when he says it, when he calls for a restructuring or redistribution of the energy, the type of the way consumption taking place today. And 
uh, rural communities need to have, I mean, the way we used to talk about equitable water access to everybody, I think we also need to talk about equitable access to energy, but with a low carbon type of thing. So that's a pathway which I'm going to talk about. And I think it has got implications both at a local level in terms of meeting local incomes and livelihood needs of people and also global uh, in terms of energy uh, self-reliance. Uh, there are three key concepts that I just want to, but I, I don't think it is new to all of you, but I think we should keep in mind. When we talk about energy and things, there is the, one is uh, the whole question of total energy, which comprises all energy required for a service material technology, including both fuel or direct energy plus energy input through materials. In fact, I think materials embodiments of energy and things, plus the energy which is both direct and indirect involved, involved in making this particular service or material or technology available to the end user at the end point. I think this is one of the criteria which we need to ask is the type of universe we talk about in terms of low carbon and things. What does this whole composition look like? Second thing which we generally we don't talk about is that when we talk about any innovation or new technologies or alternative technologies, what is the type of energy gain ratio it involves? I think it's an important thing because there are a whole lot of things which even Ministry of Environment and other you know, energy and you know, renewable energy promotes today. In the same technology, the machine itself, the type of energy it consumes probably much more than the type of energy it can produce. So I think the type of energy gain ratio is an important concept we need to keep that. Third thing is that what is the type of multiplier you get? In fact, of fuel value replacement multiplier. So when we put biomass for certain use and type of thing, what is the type of energy multiplier we get? So I think unless we use these are some of the indices or the type of criteria to evaluate innovations, we will be talking about this type of innovations in terms of low carbon, but ultimately in the largest sense probably may not be contributing. Uh, there are four major areas uh, in which this type of multiplier at different degrees is possible. One is the whole question of materials technology. Second is process heat and solar thermal technology, electricity, chemicals, and fuels. And we have been able to do some work in the first two areas, materials technology and the process heat. I mean, which is very dear to Mr. Dati. In fact, how you make energy available to the <coughs> artisans and uh, rural uh, producers and things. So in these two areas, we have been able to make some headway and things. And my presentation is going to be only limited to materials uh, technology, which have been done. We also try to, when we ask this question, uh, I mean, this all getting into that, what is the type of, uh, you know, uh, characteristics of these alternative technologies? Otherwise, very often when we talk about alternative technology, there is an underlying assumption that this is inferior to, you know, what is the traditional or the conventional type of things which are available. So one thing is that whenever we talk about an alternative technology, then it should have equal performance or function. It should not compromise on that. Second types of cost, either you should have same or preferably lower lifetime cost, the type of things which you offer. Third, I think for today's discussion, most important is that lower energy intensity materials and the type of application which I'm going to talk about has a factor of about three to five, you know, the type of uh, use of uh, this uh, in the energy intensity materials. It has a high component of local labor and materials. I mean, that's an important thing in terms of uh, local livelihoods and incomes and other uh, uh, things. It also calls for, a, it has a potential for skill upgradation of the local people, especially local toilers, artisans, uh, agricultural laborers and things. And also it is amenable to modular design. So keeping workplaces or setting up workplace at the you know, village or at two villages together and type of thing, that, this one, so you can produce most of this in a modular thing. And, assemble it at your sites uh, wherever you need. There are some of these important characters we need to keep in mind. We have been able to, uh, I mean, we have been talking about use of biomass in the infrastructure basically for two reasons. One, if you look at rural uh, systems or rural toilers, uh, one is that they do lack from access to infrastructure. I think India suffers from uh, lack of infrastructure, especially in the rural areas, and that of infrastructure we built is also basically a fossil-based uh, type of thing. So I think infrastructure as an area where biomass to be targeted is an important thing. Second, if you look at the type of public expenditure, it lands up, I think, about I mean, a large proportion of the public expenditure today lands up in one or the other type of infrastructure sectors. So the plea is that in terms of policy directions, even if you make a 5% shift from this expenditure to this type of thing, it you know, opens up an enormous uh, you know, uh, um, uh, pathway for a, uh, you know, in terms of value addition and other type of potentials. So here we have water. Buildings both in terms of residential and public and roads. These are three areas we have been able to work, which I'll be present. In the water sector, we have been able to make some inroads into basically what you call diversion storage structures, whether it is timber gabions, it is overflow structures, which I'll talk about it. 
and also non overflow structures earthen structures and type of thing storage and other things or pipelines and various type of channeling and things and this is an important thing because water is an important sector in the rural areas and for the people's lives and type of thing so how do you look at uh, this is an important thing especially in india where we talk about a whole lot of increased investments in the watershed development and the type of technology choices we make there whether it is in terms of uh, you know uh, um, check dams and other type of things an important thing today i think uh, india spends annually something like about 5000 crores roughly around watershed development which would be increased either at two times or three times in the new plan which is going to come and nearly 40 to 50% of this expenditure goes into water structures and most of it is basically cement you know structures and so can we think about a different pathway there uh, this is a very uh, i mean the quality of the picture is not good this is one of the first beginnings we made in orissa where we constructed a um, uh, timber gabion on a small nala called ganda nala uh, in this this is the type of a site excavation you find you find the type of timber structures you find. this uh, when i talk about timber these are small dimension timber which you can grow in a space of about three to four years and type of thing and it can be any straight growing timber which you can i mean it does not be a, a quality uh, 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 things and also the locally available materials like stones and clay has been used in this uh, there's a bit of a lining which is done so that it controls seepage and you find the structure completed here and it is an overflow structure which has been taking uh, overflow of uh, uh, things in floods and things now this is a structure which was constructed i think early 90s uh, in Orissa. So this is one of the prototypes we have made and this has been the technology has been standardized. There are manuals around this now, you know how to go about it and things. Uh, this is an inter interesting thing, this Gokharan Reservoir, which is very close to the uh, scene uh, Karnataka. In fact, it's a bit, little bit of a high-end use. There's, you can find a lot of cottages uh, there. So there's an artificial small water body which has been created. And since very close to the uh, CRZ area and things, so there was limits to groundwater extraction and other uh, type of things. So this is a basically a water harvesting structure and storage uh, things which is enough to meet uh, the needs of about 25 families and things and also it also is taking care of the whole uh, what you call the water table issue or the water logging there because uh, i think so you also through uh, this the third site uh, we have done is the type of lining of storages and things the locust lining and other type of thing where when we talk about dispersed water systems in the rural areas and things you need to create this type of buffer storages and things so can you think about this? So these are the three or four areas we have done some working with channeling or lining or pipelines and other things. I won't get to the details. But water has been an area where we have some of you know off the shelf technologies which today available over a period of 20 years. We have been able to standardize uh, some of these things and which have been utilized, promoted in various uh, uh, rural contexts. The second area which I want to talk about is buildings, especially when we talk about buildings, the usual conventional scenario that we use steel, cement, concrete, bricks, synthetics and other type of things. Now can we at least replace partially with bamboo, small dimension, timbers, fibers and in fact use these in judicial combinations with the uh, above. So here we are not saying that you totally abolish or totally do away with fossils and type of thing, but fossils to be used in a particular manner judiciously. And here the type of uh, designing principles which are used is that you need to optimize materials through their functioning. Now, for example, the type of thing uh, like uh, you know, force of compression, probably a cement mortar type of a thing will be much better suited for that. But for tensile forces and other type of thing, small dimension timber may be good. Or shear transfer, joinery and type of thing, maybe steel and other type of things are useful. So we have been able to combine this type of thing and come up with a uh, you know, composite uh, type of a uh, structure. Now, this is a small office which is created as a two-story building in Kerala near Cochin. There is an interesting group of architects called Inspiration and we have been able to work with that group where the structural components have come from the innovation which we have been able to do in terms of columns and beams and other uh, type of things or to some extent even the walls. And the interior architecture and other type of thing has come up with the Inspiration group which has been a philosophically tied to Laurie Baker's ideas about uh, uh, things. Uh, this is the type of treated bamboo wall which has been created as part of this uh, uh, thing. You also find the bamboo roof cover uh, uh, on this. Uh, you also have a load bearing floor because it's a multi story it's a two story uh, structure uh, and construction and things. So this has been there for the last about, uh, probably about eight to nine years now. This has been functioning, anybody can go and see uh, this quite architecturally beautifully done. I mean, uh, low cost technology of this type need not be aesthetically bad, it can be also aesthetically good. Uh, in Pune, near Pune Kamshet, we've also been involved in a, another project where uh, housing plus a school building type of construction is coming up, a different type of slightly different design which is being uh, used in this. 
Um, uh, the third thing I think is an important thing I want to talk about. This is a small village called Bahay in Sangli, where there was a, a movement of the deserted women. I mean, people who have been deserted by their husbands and things, and in Maharashtra, especially in Maharashtra, in some of the communities, their presence is, or the proportion is pretty high. So the movement had organized these women around uh, some of the issues, and they got housing sites as a uh, legitimate right because of the struggles and the mobilization things. So here we are trying to build a different type of a houses for this. Uh, women, there are about 22 units which has been built. So on your first picture you find is a twin dwelling units which has something about a usable space about 200 square feet uh, area uh, inside and things. So I'll take it through your different stages of the construction uh, which is involved. And the picture below here you also find the actual these women, the desert women involved in the whole you know preparation of the material and type of thing for uh, sizing the bamboo and also treating this uh, with uh, uh, timber and things. So you find the different stages of uh, construction involved. Uh, and things. So in the last slide, you also find the roofing material, which is the primary uh, line is a non-fabric uh, organic material, which is in that. On top of that, there is a polyethylene uh, which is put. Now, these houses have, uh, ah, we also built up some type of rooftop water harvesting uh, with that. So whatever the water falls on those roofs, also collected into a small uh, pond there, which is also lined pond with uh, polyethylene which has got a uh, cover which is made. And after covering, you find this type of plot which is around there. And the women have already started construct, uh, I mean, cultivating small vegetables and other type of thing. We also set up a small, what you call a pedal, uh, this uh, pump, uh, which you can operate with your legs. And the women start ID this type of a kit treadle with, pump. yeah, treadle pump, treadle. sorry. Yeah, so which is operated by the women. And so it's a very interesting unit where you have a housing unit, you have a rooftop water harvesting, and the women are also uh, cultivating some vegetables around uh, these issues. Uh, the third area of innovation I said is about roads, basically. Um, so basically, re reinforcement of road bases and sub base. And we find a whole lot of roads, especially whether it is cities or the rural areas, cracking up because it cannot transfer the loads, the pressure, uh, you know, uniformly and things. Now, the type of work, in fact, it has been also done for some of the government agencies, not just NGO work which has been done. And it has been comparable with the geogrid or geocell of synthetic materials, which is generally practiced in the Western countries and type of thing. We have been able to uh, change that into bamboo geogrids uh, for this. We have been able to do it in three locations. One is Orissa. Uh, near Panvel, there is a steel yard where heavy truck movement takes place where every about 10 or 12 years back, we considered about a two kilometer road which Sitco itself monitors every year and there's a small patch of road approach road to this uh, inspiration office in Cochin uh, where we are constructed. Uh, this is the way you create uh, bamboo grids. We also find that uh, this experience like bamboo is a material for example if you put a nail or something it splits because of the uh, type of thing. So here we are going for what you call a reconstituted bamboo. In fact this also technology which has been now standardized to some extent uh, Forest Services Institute has a unit of this where you actually crush the bamboo like a sugarcane crusher, take it out and then put it back through adhesive and a high pressure type of a thing and where the workmanship is much better and it compares with any like teak or other type of wooden thing. So in Mumbai also they have set up a small unit now. But what I'm saying to say is some of these things are also getting standardized and getting into mainstream production uh, to some extent. So here the whole bamboo grid is being laid and on that the surfacing is being done. Um, so these are, the, I mean, there are a whole lot of other things which I've done, like retaining walls, construction through uh, some of these things where erosions uh, take place or bank erosion and other type of thing, whether in terms of uh, sea areas or other, you know, slopey areas and other type of thing. Um, the, I mean, I don't want to go into the advantage. I think people have been talking about, the, I mean, the whole question of the energy, uh, uh, you know, multiply which you get and type of thing. But there are also certain issues which you need to address. One is that the poor interfiber bond leading to splitting, which I mentioned, especially in the context of uh, bamboo. There's also dimensional instability, sus susceptibility to biodegradation and things which can be taken care of through some type of chemical treatments to some extent and other things. But I think more important that these materials are basically seen. There's a mindset issue here that is are basically amenable to non-engineered. I mean, that's a type of broad mindset we have about small dimension timber or bamboo and type of thing. So we always advocate you know, consumer goods type of like, you no, know, you make small things out of that. That's important sector. It also opens up certain value addition potential. But I think this mindset is also important to change that. This material also is amenable to engineered uh, you know, designs and, uh, uh, and things. So in terms of overcoming, we have been able to do some of these experiments on reconstituted bamboo and other things. There are standard procedures which are there. Uh, other, another innovation we have done is that earlier when we were making the columns and type of thing, these uh, biomass-based members were embedded in the concrete or other type of thing. 
that was leading to certain problems in terms of joining uh, the two materials and things. I'll just close in two minutes, yeah. Uh, but we are also now in the inspiration building, which I talked about coaching, we have been also used this uh, membrane as an external attachment. Uh, so some of these standardized been also done. Uh, I think more than some of the, I mean, these are details we can get into, uh, but then there are larger issues involved in this. I think one is in terms of changing mindsets, changing mindsets of people at different levels. I'm not saying the only changing the minds of the rural people or rural population or the toiling masses of the rural areas, but I think right from the policy makers, the type of investments you make, the type of R&D work which is being taken through the mainstream uh, research institutions and things, I think we, this calls for, if this has to be generalized and taken at a much larger scale, then probably it calls for a type of thing. Second issue, I think it involves a very large scale of capacity building. Here, I'm not talking about capacity building of a conducting a training program and other type of thing. It, diff it involves a different way of engaging with the rural toilers in terms of organizing them, the type of issues around which we organize them. These issues need to be taken to the uh, rural population, see that a different pathway is possible and a different type of politics around these things to be organized. Second, it also calls for a very large scale resource literacy program about some of these resources which are there at the locally available, what are its potential, so that people themselves can make informed choices uh, of these things. It also calls for new skills. I mean, uh, the type of technology which I talked about is that, for example, a person, a boy or a girl who has gone through something like a uh, ITA type of training is able to do uh, uh, this type of thing. So there is also, it involves, uh, you know, large scale, this type of skill upgradation type of thing. In fact, some of the issues which we are now facing, especially in this Bahia, where this whole housing is for deserted women, where illiterate women, even for small operation maintenance, things we need to call people from outside and type of this. So we need to create a social, you know, section there who is capable of uh, handling some of these even very simpler issue of operation maintenance and repairs and other type of things which is out there. The third set of issues is that whole question of availability of biomass. Um, biomass, actually, the way the perspective I said that, that's I'm uh, uh, coming back to my original, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, introductory remarks, say that it's a part of a larger production system in which, how do you look at the type of, you know, different types of wastelands which you have? How do we look at the type of watershed development which will take place and things? So these are type of a biomass which can be easily produced as a short do uh, rotation uh, type of a program, like three to four years and things. Second thing is that the non-availability of processing. Now, if you look at some of this where we have to get material from very far away places where they have some type of processing or a, uh, a treatment facilities and things. So making some of these basic facilities available at the, with the rural people is an important precondition uh, for that. We are also talking about pooling of biomass, for example, you know, at, uh, you know things so that the producers of biomass can pool these uh, things. So um, as I said, also, there's also questions of change of policy in terms of financing and various other type of things involved. And also we need to take a hard look at what is possible within the present social relations and things, what is not possible out of these type of thing. If you need to really generalize this whole thing and to really move into our society into a low carbon type of thing, then probably uh, I think to some extent what Dignuda indicated also calls for a much more radical social transformative processes. We will be able to demonstrate certain type of things which is possible, but you have to really take it forward. It also calls for a different type of politics in the rural area leading to uh, radical change. I think I'll stop here. Yeah.